good evening friends thank you for joining us on this uh, right in the middle of the diwali celebration across india and across the indic world across the hindu world wherever uh, people of indian origin are they're celebrating diwali but we stick to our schedule and we are today back with our 14th india studies webinar in which i'm privileged to host professor Stephen Phillips, who used to be a, who used to be my neighbor when I was in Dallas area for over a decade, but now I'm in Pune and I'm privileged to meet him and host him through Zoom platform for his great presentation that he's going to give us today. So <clears throat> let's start with uh, with his bio. Let's let me introduce him. Dr. Stephen Phillips is professor emeritus at the University of Texas at Austin and has been visiting professor of philosophy at the University of Hawaii and Jadavpur University, India. Author of 10 books, including Aurobindo's Philosophy of Brahman, Brill 1984, Classical Indian Metaphysics, Refutations of Realism and the Emergence of New Logic, and Yoga, Karma and Rebirth, A Brief History and Philosophy. Named by choice an outstanding academic title, he has more recently written Classical Indian Epistemology, the knowledge source, sources of the Nyaya school, which presents classical Indian views and terminology suited for philosophy professionals. With Matthew Dasty, he published the Nyaya Sutra selections with early commentaries. And with Dasty and Nirmala, Nirmalya Guha, a short text, God and the World's Arrangement, Vedant and Nyaya Philosophy of Religion. Phillips, Dr. Phillips teamed with N.S. Ramanujat Tatacharya to translate the perception chapter of the monumental 14th century Tattva Chintamani, wish fulfilling jewel of reflection on the truth about epistemology by Gan Gesha, American Institute of Buddhist Studies, and Mutila, 2008 in 750 pages volume. A translation of the entire text in three volumes, about 2,000 pages, has now been published by Bloomsbury 2020 in a solo authored set, including much historical and philosophical exegesis. A synopsis is available on leto.stanford.edu slash entry slash Gangesha. Professor Phillips, it's a privilege and honor to host you, such a senior scholar, and uh, we are, we can't wait for to have you and present your presentation today on Indian knowledge systems. So, Maskarani. So, you know, the topic of the self and no self, nature of the self, its essential attributes, or whether there is a self at all, is one of the great topics of classical Indian philosophy. And every school, uh, all the Ostika schools, sometimes called the Orthodox schools, uh, and Vedanta, Mimamsa, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, um, Vaisheshika, and Yoga, and Sankhya, plus the Buddhist schools, the Gnostica schools, Charvaka, the China schools, all take issues on self and arguments concerning its reality and nature. In particular, as we see in this abstract, the question of what accounts for personal identity through change, bodily change, emotional change, thoughts changing, is uh, a topic that is related to the question of the self, and self-awareness, subjectivity. Another one that uh, we can talk about today is enlightenment and yogic practice. Uh, all all of the uh, these views that are mentioned here on the slide, Vedanta, Yoga, Chara, Buddhism, Nyaya, Charvaka, uh, have something to say about this and, and we'll talk about them all, but the views of the Nayayakas and Buddhist in particular. So there'll be about 20 slides. Now, um, first of all, I'll just notice that this is this is a primary argument of the Buddhist, uh, the Buddhist uh, Dharma Kirti, maybe the 
greatest of the Buddhist thinkers, and it makes this argument over and over again. It says, look, if if two things uh, have different properties, they're not the same. So you know, he, he says <laughs> there's no enduring self because look, uh, right now I don't know. Uh, I have so many hairs on my head. I pull one out. I have less. So I am not the same person that I was before. At least this body is not the same body because <laughs> there are fewer hairs on my head now than there were a few minutes before. Now, the Nyayakas, the two groups, uh, Nyayakas and Buddhists who debate about this in particular, use examples that are favorable to the one side or the other. Uh, the Nyayaka's favorite example is a pot, Guttaha. And uh, it can be red before baking, but black afterwards. And you say, it's the same pot. You put the pot in, we baked it, it changed colors. The Buddhists like the example of uh, a candle, uh, which uh, they say is very obviously different every moment as it melts. Uh, and what we're going to be thinking about is the person. And I don't know, now that I'm an old person, I, <laughs> I have, it's amazing that I can still identify with, I don't know, at least the 10 year old I was a long time ago. Of course, many others in between. And I think, of course, we'll all like that. Uh, and in Western philosophy, there's this famous uh, ship of, of Theseus example uh, that uh, uh, Plutarch in Latin wrote, the ship wherein Theseus and the youth of Athens returned from Crete had 30 oars and was preserved by the uh, Athenians down even to the time of Demetrius, for they took away the old planks as they decayed, putting in new and stronger timber in their place. And so much that this ship became a standing example among the philosophers of the logical question of things that grow. One side holding that the ship remained the same, the other contending that it was not the same. If there's just one ship of Theseus, you can imagine they're changing the planks over and over again. And so eventually they have a ship that has none of the planks that it had when it set forth. And then they save all the planks and build a new one, which is the ship of Theseus. <laughs> Look at the candles, how dramatic they change. Now, uh, in Western philosophy, the Greeks took this up. Uh, Plato mentions Parmenides, who argues that change is illusory. Heraclitus changes pervasive. There's this famous saying attributed to him that you can't step into the same river twice. Aristotle has the view that is probably the most dominant throughout Western philosophy. It was very much like Nyaya, accidental properties change while the simple properties remain the same. To take the pot example, it's being a pot, it's pothood or potness, so to say, stays the same. But it's color changes. How about a person, David, that there are John? <sighs> Do they stay the same? And what are the essential properties? There. And Plutarch, of course, brought that puzzle. Hume, the famous David Hume, said uh, very much like the Buddhist said, the self is a bundle of impressions or experiences. There are no essential properties disagreeing with Aristotle. Identity depends upon rapidity of change. So um, what we call identity, there's no true identity. And then Kant famously, Immanuel Kant argued that there is something like a Nyayaka self, or maybe not, some, some took it more like a Vedantic self. We can talk about that later. Uh, he, he said, look, um, there is what I like to call the transcendental unity of apperception in that for any thought or experience I have, I may say, I think that thought. I mean, I can, it's a feature of the self that it can comprehend all of its uh, awarenesses. There's, <laughs> there's a, a ship of Theseus. Now some classical Indian views of the self. Uh, of course, 
one of the most difficult to understand is that of Advaita Vedanta. Uh, uh, and here, of course, it's important to Advaita Vedanta being a monistic view, all is Brahman. And the bridge to Brahman seems to be self-awareness. Atman is Brahman, but Atman not in the ordinary Abhimana, as the Advaitins would say, identity which is false. The, uh, one has to realize in a kind of yogic or mystical experience what the Upanishads say, Tatramasi, and 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 this eternal self, which is the absolute, doesn't really change. It, it doesn't act in the ordinary sense of action. That's a big issue, uh, but it does have our awarenesses. I mean, it lives in us. I mean, it witnesses everything that happens. Yogacara Buddhism maybe has a similar view about enlightenment as Vedanta, but there is no self. They think that is a, a conceptual crutch that is does not lead to uh, the highest uh, mystical experience. Uh, but there, there are lots of, there's lots of overlapping themes with Vedanta. Uh, for example, what the Advaitins would call false abhimana, uh, identifying uh, with uh, transient matters, transient experience. The yoga charans would say, "Yes, that's right. That's what." So, so you shouldn't call that a, a self. All of our um, I, uh, normal ideas about how to get along the world are just pragmatically constructed fictions. They're useful fictions. And, and so uh, it, it, in terms of our overall view, what we should have is a stream theory of the person. There's no, there's just one moment is a causal factor in the next moment of experience. One state of your body is a causal factor in the next moment of, uh, of, the, of your uh, body and so on. Uh, there's nothing, there's nothing in, enduring from one moment to the next. Then we have Nyaya. And, <laughs> and uh, I would say there should be a long mark over the Nyaya here. Um, and that um, Nyaya uh, takes as its target yoga chata Buddhism in many instances and says, no, each of us is an individual self. It disagrees with Advaita Vedanta and I think most Vedanta views in that the self has properties and one, one very important one is Chakirsha, desire to do. So the self does... Uh, uh, it is a property bearer and an initiator of action. Uh, it, from one lifetime to the next, the self carries some of these properties into the next life. Now, the Vedantins can agree with some of that. They just don't think that those properties that are carried over are, mm, they're, they give a negative spin to that carrying over as well. We'll talk about Charvaka has the most extreme view, I'd say. Maybe Advaita Vedanta, where the self becomes everything, is maybe one extreme. The other extreme is the Charvaka, uh, who says, uh, the materialist, who says that the self is the living body. And there's some famous quotes from the Sarvadarshana Sangraha, um, translating, when once this body they burn, how will it again return? And so there, there is no personal survival. Now, uh, the, the Vedantins, including the Advaitins, think there is a subtle body that we don't live just in the physical body, but uh, we live uh, in it, what they call the Anamaya uh, body, Sharita. But there's also a Pranamaya body and a uh, and a lower mental uh, body that is a kosha that um, we share with animals. We have desires. Even animals have a certain kind of mentality. My, 
my dog knows where his food is, for example. Then there's a higher mental kosha, the vijnana. Uh, and then the bliss. I love this idea that the sort of the, the body that's closest to the true self is uh, a body of bliss. And then, of course, the the self is in uh, at the core. Uh, they don't really talk. It's free of bodies. Now, the Buddhists have, uh, in some ways, a similar view. They have not five bodies, but five major skanda. Uh, I think that word really means, or in everyday Sanskrit means shoulder or sort of support for ongoing personal identity. Consciousness, self-consciousness, vijnana, vedana. Uh, sen sensation, feeling, samjna, representational, representational thought, and then memory impression, samskara, um, dispositional properties that don't come to the surface. Uh, I ask you what your name is. You know, of course, you know it, but you're not thinking about it all the time. But uh, I like the disposition of water to freeze at. Uh, zero centigrade or uh, boil at 100, those dispositions go with the self. That's a very important property that the Nayayakas talk about a lot, but the Buddhists also have it, though there may be a problem with their understanding of it, at least so say the Nayayakas. And then, of course, there is the bodily skanda rupa. Um, one of the most famous passages in uh, the, the classical discussions of personal identity uh, is in the Pali canon. I think there's quite enough time to read all of this, but there's uh, questions to King Melinda. Uh, I think he was a Bactrian king, and the monk came and talked to him, and uh, and the question is, you know, who, who what, who are you? Right, um, and um, and he uses a famous analogy to a chariot. He says, and the, the Nagasena says, um, "How did you come here?" And he says, "I came in a carriage." He says, um, and the carriage, you know, the chariot or the carriage. He says, "Is the axle the chariot? No. The wheels, the framework? No. The parts, the chariot? No." Um, is there anything outside of them? No, I discover no chariot. It's an empty word. So similarly, the self uh, is Nagasena's conclusion. And so uh, the upshot of all this, to save a little time so we can have more questions, is um, through questioning, uh, uh, Nagasena gets King Melinda to admit that there is no thing that he can identify as the ego, as a self, as an I. Just like there is no thing, there are many parts that fit together and make a chariot, but no one element is the chariot. The form isn't the chariot, there could be another the same form. The combination isn't the chariot. The parts could change as with the ship of Theseus. While the object remains the same, no one element is this monk, Nagasena. Now, the form isn't Nagasena. He could have a twin. The combination isn't Nagasena. You know, you can, I don't know, you, you lose a tooth, you, get a, <laughs> you can get another one, you can get an implant. Um, I, you know, your fingernails are always growing and changing. In particular, uh, I think what we uh, need to notice about the Buddha's positions, and they, some schools of Buddhism are slightly different, but these are the mainstream positions. There's, there's a certain anti-intellectualism. Uh, the Buddha talked about questions that do not lead to edification. And the upshot, I think, is, I mean, there's a kind of paradox there, right? I mean, why does the Buddha talk so much if, if uh, and encourage questions? Uh, but nevertheless, let's put that aside. The upshot is better to meditate, practice mindfulness and everything. It, and, and 
there is, I think, to the credit of uh, the Buddhist, uh, an insistence on on uh, nir- bodhisattva and nirvana consciousness more like perceptual awareness than some kind of thought. So they connect with the yogic tradition where they say the yoga, you know, in the yoga sutra, yoga is uh, defined as chitta vritti nirodha, the restraint or even cessation of the fluctuations of mentality. And so the Buddhists do also believe that meditation requires a quiet mind. They also are nominalists. They don't have, as the Nayakas do, um, uh, universals such as uh, being a cow or cowhood, which you know is, is in Bessie and Flossie and uh, and 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 all uh, the other cows, past and present. They say no, 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 no. It's it's really the particular that's absolutely real, and this connects with their presentism. It's only the they're only particulars in the present. You don't. You don't find a universal in the present. We construct those for our own purposes, right? The past and futures are things are are constructions. Only this moment is real, and nothing endures more. from uh, the great commentator Buddha Gosha on the Pali Canon. Strictly speaking, the life of a living being is exceedingly brief, lasting only while a thought lasts. Just as a chariot wheel and rolling rolls only at one point of the tire and resting rest only at one point, in exactly the same way, the life of a living being lasts only for the period of one thought. As soon as that thought has ceased, the being is said to have ceased. As it has been said, the being of a past moment of thought has lived, but does not live, nor will it live. The being of a future moment of thought will live, but has not lived, nor does it live. The being of a present moment of thought does live, but has not lived, nor will it live. Now, there are two theories of concept acquisition here that we need to be aware of. First, they're, they're the Buddhist and the Nyayaka. Now, let me go to number two first. The Nyayaka thinks that when you see cows, you see a certain commonality. You, you pick up cowhood. And when we talk about cows, we can talk about the parts of a cow and the various attributes of a cow. Uh, so we have, from our experience of Bessie Flossing and and Shabolia, uh, the typical name for a cow uh, in classical text, um, we get the universal. Uh, we, we're, we're, we're constantly uh, uh, um, picking up universals in our sensory experience. I mean, we're not getting all cows at once. Of course not. Nevertheless, from, from seeing a few cows, we know when we see a future cow that that's a cow. And we couldn't do that if we hadn't apprehended the universal. But the Buddhists, of course, say, con, con, let's go back, let me see. Um, uh, the Buddhists say that, no, no con, we, our concepts like cow are shaped by um, uh, our desires. Uh, a good example may be a shoestring. Uh, used, uh, we would say to tie a shoe. But a bird sees a shoestring as nest material. There's a famous quote about uh, a young uh, woman, uh, which a young man sees as uh, possibly a wife. Um, uh, But uh, let's see, uh, a a hyena sees uh, as food, uh, and uh, a monk sees as a corpse. Um, desire is the world maker. De- we use concepts in order to get what we want and avoid what we don't want, um, including the Four Noble Truths. Of course, uh, no, so they're not Nyaya, because the world is as it is. We pick it up through our experience uh, and our 
concepts are founded in in not just our experience but in the reality of things out there that are the objects of our experience now the nyayakas have two main arguments against the stream theory of the buddhist one is diachronic synthesis the other is uh, synchronic synthesis or maybe better unification in that case now, the diachronic uh, synthesis or synthesis over time, um, uh, I, I, there was a Sanskritist, Andrew Nicholson, that I saw a few weeks apart. Um, and in Sanskrit, uh, you know, this is that David Dutta I saw yesterday. Well, uh, it's not so much that David Dutta has endured, though that's also true. But how can I recognize Devadatta uh, today had I not seen him yesterday? How can I, the truth of my statement, this is that Devadatta that I saw yesterday, I, give me some reason why I shouldn't think that that's true. And the truth entails that Devadatta that I am now perceiving, encountering, it is not just that he's the same, but that I'm the same. Otherwise, I wouldn't have that memory of him. So how is this possible on the Buddhist stream theory? It seems like it's not. Then with the synchronic, that's uh, the, the example is different. It's the same time. So I am touching what I see. So um, I'm right now touching this uh, cup of tea and so this this uh, and so i'm seeing it and touching all at the same time now it's the same object if that looks like the, on the buddhist theory i should be having one stream of tactile experience and another stream of visual experience but no i have a unified experience in the moment and there has to be then an overseer sensory experience that puts them all together so um, Nyaya also holds that there is a convergence of knowledge sources, Pramana Samplava. They recognize five knowledge sources, perception, inference, analogy, and testimony. And so uh, Nyaya also holds, this is not usually brought out in the, in the literature, uh, but uh, one commentator on the Nyaya Sutra, uh, Ujyotakara, brings it out quite clearly. He says, look, um, we don't need really arguments. Perception itself or self-perception um, shows us that there is a self. When I say I am seeing a table or I am seeing a cup or so on, what does I mean? You, <laughs> you, you're referring to yourself. Uh, but Buddhists, of course, dispute the claim that a self is known perceptually. So that's why, says Ujyotakara, that we have to have these inferences. I mean, normally when you see something and it's right in front of you, there's just no dispute about it. We're not going to argue about what is apparent in our immediate vicinity. Uh, but we do have to argue about the self because uh, the Buddhists do dispute <laughs> that the self is known perceptually. So we give these two arguments. The, this is that David said, why I have to be the same in order to recognize, it's called the argument for recognition, in English usually called diachronic synthesis, and then also this uh, simultaneous uh, two, through two sense modalities. Uh, and then there's really this other one about, we, we know ourselves immediately. Now the Buddhists rejoin, they say, look, you don't, you don't, <laughs> You, you have the wrong idea about existence. You can't just read off your sense experience what exists. Existence is a matter of a causal power. So there has to be something that causes that. And they think that is the samskara, that, that mental disposition that is caused. It's the link between your first experience yesterday of Devadatta 
and then you know it's it's like the seed in the in the granaries is changing every moment but eventually it sparks the memory and you put that together but look everything everything is changing together everything is influences everything else um so think things but change things change in lines of causality however um there are auxiliary causes sometimes dramatic for example the seed in the granary is only changing a slight bit but you put the seed in soil with water and warmth and a little bit of sunshine and it changes dramatically into the sprout so you're few you're confused said the buddhist about the nature of existence and have an inadequate theory of the causal underpinnings of your current experience. It's not the self so much as your previous experience. But now Udayana, who's a fantastic philosopher, who's really the inaugurator of what's called Navyanaya, and uh, though Gangesha usually gets the credit, uh, he often really lies on innovations by Diana, who lived in about 1000 CE. Uh, Gangesha is about 1300. Um, Gangesha, uh, sorry, Udayana has an argument against the Buddhist in the Atma uh, um What's it? Uh, uh, it's on the Atma, on the truth about the self. And um, he has in that treatise uh, an argument where he says, well, okay, you Buddhists rely on some scars as causal factors in, in recognition and other kinds of experience. Well, look, um, how do they enter consciousness? They're supposed to be below the threshold, their dispositional properties. In particular, there's the problem of deep sleep. Um, and, and he picks up on um, I'm taking this from Udayana, but Vachaspati is really his predecessor, is the one that makes it in his commentary uh, on the Nyaya Sutra. He says, look, if there's a stream where the present moment is most responsible for the, uh, uh, the, the immediately preceding moment is most responsible for the what's going on in the present moment how about when you wake up from deep sleep how how, how does self-consciousness get going there you don't have it in deep sleep and and udayana's great example is look you don't have look i'll show here here is empirical evidence that you don't have self-consciousness. It's not a stream that's continuing in deep sleep. We say such things as, how well I slept, out like a light. How well I slept, without dreaming. Sukto hum, nakim chit, avijnyasi sham. Okay, another player, not enough for, we have plenty to talk about. Maybe we should stop now and entertain some questions but really should get out on the table the materialist view which is maybe closest to a lot of views of contemporary philosophers all over the world uh, influenced by science that um though there is this also uh, sort of hedonism with charlaka while life is yours, live joyously. None can escape death's searching eye when once this body they burn. How will it again return? The self is the living body. Another quotation from the Sarvadarshan of Sangraha. In this school, the four elements, earth and so on, are the original principle from these alone when transferred into the body, intelligence is produced just as inebriating power is developed from the mixing of certain ingredients. In other words, you put, put together the right ingredients, something emerges. And that's a very common view in contemporary thought. And here's an ev another bit of evidence. We say such things as I am fat. Um, what does I refer to? Not like uh, uh, 
the Nayakas, Ujotakata, and Udayana say, uh, I refers to the body. The, according to your view, the self's not fat. Uh, now, of course, there is some contrary evidence. Uh, we use uh, mama shariva, right? my body. Uh, and, and the Charvakas say, well, that, those are just metaphors. And then Charvakas start debunking uh, ritualism. They say priests want money, uh, all this stuff about the self. There is just for uh, people who couldn't make a living in any other way. And, and say, okay, um, and the, the living body is perceptually known. And then Charvaka, in a very interesting move, says that perception is the only pramana, the only source of knowledge. So your arguments don't count against us. Uh, and they attack uh, the Nyaya theory of inference by saying there's no... There are no universal propositions, such as this sort of stock Nyaya example is there's smoke on yonder mountain, the Paksha, the mountain, and, and there's a Hetu, an indicator, um, smoke. And there's a general principle wherever there's smoke, there's fire, wherever, uh, wherever there X is S, it's also P. And so we say, aha, there's fire on the mountain and it's really important maybe your house is over there you want to go and put it out but uh, charlaka says no we don't experience uh we don't have evidence for this no one nothing could justify this claim wherever smoke their fire or any so nyaya then takes up the problem of inductive generalization and uh, to talk about uh Gengesha, I don't know, not really the founder of Navyanaya so much as a solidifier. Um, I think uh, there are others, Manikanta Mishra, I mentioned Udayana, who also made many advances, but he pulls them all together. And he says, look, um, your argument against, <laughs> against inference is a is an argument, it is a kind of inference, and so it's self-defeating. I mean, it, yeah. so any argument against inference is going to be self-defeating. Uh, he also uh, has a, a, a pragmatic argument. He says, you know, notice what, um, this, what these skeptics do. I mean, they assume that when they speak, uh, the audience will understand their uh, terms and so they're assuming a vyapti or universal concomitance between speaking and being heard. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't speak. Um, or, and same thing for you know if they want to drive away mosquitoes, they start a fire to get smoke. So they do accept the causal principles in life uh, that. Uh, underpin inference. Now, there's also a very interesting argument in Gangesha, but it is a little complicated in that it's what's called the negative only inference. And I don't know if uh, we want to spend uh, too much time on it. Um, also, just to comprehend the notion of the negative only inference is uh, it is a bit of a challenge, uh, but the argument goes like this. Look, um, every living body has a self. Why? Because it has breath. And the examples are, uh, it, it, it's thought that you know, even plants have a certain kind of breath um, and all animals. Uh, so, but things, look at things that don't have breath. The pot clearly doesn't have a self. And a, and a cloth and so on. And so based upon all those negative examples, we make the correlation that, you know, unlike a pot, that, a cell, that uh, there is a self, every living body has a self, that's the puksha. And, and that, see, every living body, so, so it, you, we can't just sort of build up an inductive generalization here because the puksha is already universal. So we have to have a negative only inference. And I have a diagram that if I could draw, I could show you, make an X out here, but I think 
let's not do that. Um, there, um, here, here is though um, a uh, a nice uh, argument uh, that uh, really targets materialism uh, and echoes the Nyaya Sutra, which talks about the the qualities or properties of a cell. And then it, 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 the argument goes like this. With it established that desire resides in a substance, I mean, desires don't free float. They qualify people. People have desires. So what is that substance? And you don't find desire in earth or water or any of the, the other eight substances that are emitted on the Nyaya view. It's a property. Uh, each one of those um, possibilities, including manas and buddhi, no, um, uh, desire doesn't occur there. It rules out. Uh, so that since we have desires, there has to be a substance that is over and above the eight, uh, another substance. So um, what that is, is, is a self. Uh, so that that is that is that ninth uh, substance is the self. Desire is had by nothing but a self. Okay, to wind up, um, just want to go quickly over the Advaita view of the self. The self is self awareness aware in a certain fashion, swaya prakashamana, and so. If you want to start debating about a self the way you naiyak, that's really not to the point because only the self has a right to pronounce on itself. It's swataha pramana, not your arguments. And the self is reachable in samadhi, brahmasakshatkata. Otherwise, the self is unknowable. So you're wasting your time with these inferences, counter inferences. The self is not an agent. I mean, there, there's a sense in which, even with Shankar, the most radical uh, non dualist or Advaita view, um, that Ishvara is an agent. Ishvara acts, but you know, the Ishvara acts, your, the, the self doesn't act the way a normal person, an ordinary person, unenlightened person does, um, because a normal person acts out of desire to get what he or she wants and to avoid what he or she does want and the self's not like that uh, the self does witness uh, which is derivative from brahman self is not the body and we went we went over the five she's and it lives in those five she's until liberation uh, I think the Nyayakas also think there's a subtle body, but they, that subtle body actually qualifies the self. It's not different. Samaptam. Uh, thank, thank, thank you very so much. much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We, <clears throat> we will now have some question answer session. Uh, there is already one question from. Uh, from Shikha Sharma, and the question is, uh, does Advait Vedant accept the entity of Karta? If yes, what is the nature of Karta? If no, who is a Mumukshu in Advait Vedanta? Okay, oh, I'm sorry. How do I, oh, I just took this off. That's the okay. question. There we go, okay. Um, uh, yes. Um, uh, <laughs> the point is to be sattvic with the Advaita Vedanta. And, and so surely every, everyone knows, Shankara knows, and his followers know that in some sense, everyone has to act. And even following a path seems to be amount of action. But self-discovery, Brahmasaksha cut it, that's something of a, in a so wonderful that once a person has it or as it is in itself to talk about action in the ordinary way which is and he's talking about mimamsa because remember he's writing for people who know sanskrit 
which are ritualists and they have a Kamarla and all, uh, Shabara and Pravaka, they all have a very definite theory of action where action requires desire. Whereas for him, for Shankara, the Advaitins, the state of pure self-awareness is a state without desire. So you can't talk about action. Now, and, and the Buddhist face this too. I mean, what about the desire for uh, nirvana? Isn't you're supposed to transcend desire, but how about the desire for nirvana? Well, there are a couple of answers to that. One is that's not really a desire. That's something else. But, uh, <laughs> So, but that doesn't that involve action? Well, no, because meditation is not really an action. It's a sort of pulling back the manas from its involvement in the organs of sense to, um, I mean, when that's just a metaphor. If that, you know, that's which either various meditation, I'm trying to help you uh, um, tune into uh, self limiting self awareness. Uh, but there's really nothing to do. It is what it is. I'm sorry. I, I'm just trying my best. I think that it's a great question. The Nayakas very much disagree with this. They say, no, it's a, to do something is a proper, the, the self always has, a, even a liberated self has the ability to act if it wants to. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> great, great question. Great answer. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, every, anybody else uh, can easily unmute himself or, or herself and ask questions. Professor Phillips is still here with us, all the way from New Mexico in the USA, 8 a.m. in the morning there. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, most welcome to unmute yourself and start your video and ask questions. Hi, Steve. Oh, Papu, I think. Rama Rao, Rama yes, Rao, yes. Papu, yes. uh, how are you? I am, mm -hmm. I am good. So you are now in Santa Fe? Uh, yes. I, excuse me, I didn't hear that. No, no, uh, are you now in Santa Fe? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I'm, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I'm in, I'm in a, just a little place. Uh, uh, not, not Santa Fe. It's, um, um it's out in the country but okay. uh the sun's starting to come in here yeah till recently my daughter used to live in new mexico albuquerque oh so, i see in albuquerque i see mm -hmm. yeah used to go to santa uh, Fe. Well, you know i this is the uh vanaprastia right i, I mean yeah I'm, I'm <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> get away from the city Play austin yeah. texas very well anyway so I hope you, I, it's not a question, but so glad to see you after a long, long time. Yes, um, sir. I like yeah. Yeah, okay. I to see you. To see you. <laughs> no, you are you are so great. All organizing all those contra, uh, all the Vedanta congresses. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, I learned them uh, uh, everything. I I, I miss them myself. <laughs> I miss those. No one has yeah. taken over that. That, well, uh, we'll... somebody has taken over the Balram. Oh, somebody's taken yeah. it. Yeah. We have a question from, uh, we have a next question from Professor Anush Shukla. Professor Shukla, yes, you can ask a yeah, question. You can uh, yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, good evening. Uh, sorry. Good morning to Professor Phillips and good evening to <laughs> Professor yeah, Pankaj. Uh, it was so nice listening to this wonderful lecture, but I think I will have to listen to it again because of uh, some network issues over here. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, you were talking about, like, I mean, the, the self in Buddhism is illusory, you said. And yes, actually, it is illusory. So um, we actually, we have to deconstruct it, deconstruct the self. Uh, what do you think, I mean, uh, how, uh, how the concept of self in Buddhism uh, it can be can it be applied today because um, when we talk of uh, the modern times actually we talk of creating a self or you know recreating a self and all the literature is about you know about creating yourself your identity so uh, don't you think that the concept in buddhism 
is a little contradictory to uh, what is uh, what is required today in the modern times. Well, um, you know, this is a, a very interesting topic. I, I, I think, uh, you know, after Kant with his transcendental unity of apperception, there there is the romantic movement where there is this uh, beginning of what's most prominent today, what you're talking about, that uh, uh, we make ourselves, there's this self-determination, um, we construct ourselves and so on. Uh, and that's really important. Um, I think um, the Buddhist idea that uh, we construct ourselves, make ourselves and so on, uh, fits in quite nicely uh, with those ideas. It's just that the Buddhist values are different. Now, in one way, they're not so different in that, you know, they're uh, in the talk I'm, I mainly drew from um, the Southern schools and the Pali Canon, uh, though, um, in, at least in the early part with uh, questions of King Melinda, but then with Yogacara and, and the Mahayana schools, you know, nirvana is not the end. There's, there's, it's the bodhisattva, and there's a even though nirvana doesn't change, there's a progression from nirvana to bodhi, and in Buddhism there are the padmatas, right? The going beyond certain qualities such as patience and um, compassion and uh, even physical strength, um, wisdom, prajna paramita is the highest. The, these qualities, and, and it seems to me that if Vedanta has some, somewhat the same as, it's um, be like Krishna. It's not only you wanna find the one true self, which is common in everyone, the one true nirvana, which is in some ways the same in everyone. No, um, there is the development of these special qualities. Uh, though, you know, that depends on the situation and the individual, though, though of course there are some universal principles in Vedanta, and also in Buddhism, such as, you know, the enlightened, you know, sarva hite ritha, they're delighted in the welfare of everyone, uh, and so on. So, I don't know, there are resources in Buddhism that seems to me to, um, uh, to, to fit in and be applicable to uh, concerns about um, uh, making yourself uh, self-determination in a certain sense. But you know, ultimately, there is this. There's a radical um, uh, religious element in Buddhism and in Vedanta. That is, you need you need to meditate. You need to find the 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 truest consciousness in yourself. And it's not a matter of identity. That <laughs> the the core is not a matter of. Uh, you know, being a lawyer, a doctor, or I don't know, prime minister of England. Uh, it's, it, it's a matter of a certain kind of meditative experience. Thank you so much. That was a great answer. Thank you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes, thank you, Professor Shukla. Anybody else would like to yeah. ask any questions? Uh, let's see. We did have, it's a Diwali celebration going on across. <laughs> across India and across the world. So still we had really great, great uh, turnout of colleagues. So any other question? Uh, Professor uh, Phillips, would you like to show us your book, the recently published book? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, <laughs> That's my duty yeah, too. I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I was, uh, took 20 years. Um, oh, wow. I worked, wow. I worked with uh, the great uh, scholar, uh, Mahapandita N. S. Ramana uh for the first volume, which you mentioned uh, on perception, but then I uh, and then a little bit on inference, but then I had to finish that in the analogy chapter, the Upamana and the Shabda chapters on my own, and I I 
I know I, <laughs> uh, this is not a quality that leads to enlightenment, I know, but I am proud. <laughs> it was that me who did it, or that was some predecessor. So anyway, they have come out, though they're, they're too expensive, I hopefully, uh, I, I imagine they'll someday be put on, they'll be put on the web by somebody and it'll be better, more available. Thank you again. All right. Well, thank yeah. you for inviting me. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. I'm early morning in New Mexico and uh, evening at Diwali. Second day of Diwali here. <laughs> thank you. Dhanivad. Pranam. Namaskar. Winner Damash. Darshanaya. Thank you.